Hello, folks. Uh, so, <laughs> so thank you very much, EuroPython, for having us uh, both here. And we'd also like to thank uh, the PyScoot community, of which the work that we, we will be presenting today would not be possible. So uh, I'd like to introduce Josh. Uh, Josh, uh, I just asked him, what's your job title at Anaconda? He's a colleague of mine. He says, I don't know. Uh, so Josh is the uh, intergalactic lead god of all things Python at Anaconda. Something and like that. He, he has a, a passion um, for Python in education. And here's Josh a few years ago at PyCon helping a beginner programmer in Python uh, with taking their first steps with uh, one of Josh's projects. And this is Nicholas. Uh, he's a software engineer um, today, uh, but he's really a tuba player, don't tell anyone. Uh, nobody's more surprised than he is to be here. Um, <laughs> and I'm delighted to be joined by him uh, for this talk today. So, uh, this is going to be a talk that involves PyScript, so just so we get a little bit uh, to, to know about you folks. Uh, how many of you here have heard of PyScript? So, they've put the lights up, and I've just realized my glasses are really dirty, so I can't really see anything at the moment. Um, so, some of you put your there hands up. Hands. Uh, some, there were some hands, uh, but the 30 second, if you're not quite sure what PyScript is, it's what it says up there. It's an open source platform for Python in the browser, and uh, we can do that because of a new technology called WebAssembly, which is an instruction set for a virtual machine that runs inside the browser, and essentially uh, what happens is that we build on top of a some Python interpreters, uh, Pyodide, for instance, is um, CPython compiled to WebAssembly. Uh, so you get real Python in the browser. So today we're going to do a very quick run through of where PyScript started out um, and what it looked like this time last year, and then take a little bit of a look at where PyScript is now and a sneak preview of the future as well. So uh, this time last year, uh, I was stood on this stage giving a presentation about PyScript. And uh, I would say the metaphor we should use is perhaps coffee. So this time last year, uh, PyScript was a mega Starbucks Americano that tastes like, uh, well, I don't know what, what you would expect from Starbucks for the <laughs> mega Americano. Watery. Uh, watery, maybe. Uh, and big and uh, a little bit uncomfortable to drink. Um, but this year, it's a very sophisticated Italian mocha brewed uh, espresso. Uh, so, how can I make that claim? Well, uh, this time last year, PyScript was uh, around 500k. It was essentially a JavaScript library that was written by Python developers. Um, so, you can imagine that, how that looked like. Um, and then this time last year, uh, well, this time now, actually, um, PyScript is around 40k. Uh, because we found our very own Web Yoda, yes. um, who has completely rewritten and re-architected PyScript uh, to make it super fast and super useful. So that's a whole order of magnitude smaller that we've got. Uh, we've also got multiple runtimes. This time last year, uh, the only Python runtime that we supported was Pyodide, which is C Python compiled to WebAssembly. Uh, but we've also been working with Damien, a fr friend of mine who's uh, the maintainer of MicroPython. MicroPython is a very small version of Python. Uh, it's about 160K to download. So with the 40K of PyScript itself and MicroPython in under 200K, you've got a working Python interpreter in the browser. Uh, so that's smaller than most images uh, on websites, for instance. Uh, we also, because we can, because we can uh, it's not what we actually do, but because we can, we also have experimental support for R, Ruby, and Lua as uh, supported um, uh, WASM runtimes. And uh, if you saw this morning, uh, my colleague uh, Antonio gave a talk about Spy, and when that matures, we hope to be able to include that as part of the PyScript uh, family as well. So in old PyScript, if you wanted to do any blocking tasks or uh, things that were compute heavy, or even as some, something as simple as a wild true loop, uh, good luck with that because your browser tab's going to crash. Um, but we have fixed that with the power of web workers. So you can have multiple web workers or a single web worker and offload those compute heavy tasks uh, to a web worker to make uh, the experience a lot better and more uh, Pythonic. Yeah. Um, so a worker is a bit like having a sub-process on your web page. Um, and uh, actually, a lot of what uh, Andrea has done with uh, PyScript is make sure that interacting with web workers through Python is as easy as possible. Um, so last year, really, because of Pyodide um, being uh, a, a large download and, and, and 
and quite expensive to run. Um, you could really only run um, PyScript on uh, a laptop or a, a desktop machine. Uh, but thanks to MicroPython, our reach has extended uh, to mobile devices. Anywhere there's a browser, uh, you can pretty much run Python now. You can so run it in the car. Then we can run it in the car if your car has a browser, if your dishwasher has a browser. Uh, we've even got people who are using PyScript to interact with Internet of Things devices as well. So there's uh, some friends at Tufts uh, who have MicroPython running on a whole bunch of hardware, and they're using MicroPython in PyScript, and they're sort of chaining it all together and making some really cool things happen. So because PyScript was very, well, very much in the early days, um, it was very much developer-focused, uh, only really friendly to developer use cases. It had a bit of uh, some rough edges that kind of made it a bit difficult to use. Documentation wasn't quite there. Uh, but now we've really improved those things and had a focus on uh, meeting users where they are. Uh, so any use cases, um, any application. Uh, PyScript has a, a big, vibrant community now, uh, which we really encourage you to join. Uh, whether you're doing a very basic project or a more advanced project, uh, PyScript is there for you. And finally, um, I'm a VI user, so I'm just using VI as a kind of a proxy for a code editor here. So last year, if you wanted to uh, write PyScript, uh, Pi um, you just had to use your code editor. Uh, but uh, you can still do that, but you can also use PyScript.com now, which is an Anaconda product that's free to use. If you want to try PyScript, just sign up. It's free. And just go write some Python code in your browser. It also hosts your apps as well, so you'll be able to share them as well. Um, and uh, over in the last few weeks, I've been working on some code spaces so that uh, you can just get VS code in your browser in GitHub uh, and write your um, uh, PyScript there as well, deploy it to GitHub pages, for instance. So um, Josh mentioned the community. Uh, get out your phones. Uh, that's where you connect to uh, the community, is basically on our Discord uh, server. Uh, we didn't decide that. The community did. So we've kind of gone to where the community are. Um, but uh, it's a friendly community. It's growing very quickly as well. Uh, we have uh, every week there are community calls, and uh, lots of really cool things are happening. Yeah, and also, if you want to learn a bit more about the technicals of PyScript, uh, there is a docs at uh, docs.pyscript.net. Uh, it's a really good place if you just want to learn how to get started, or if you're integrating PyScript in a more complicated application, all the sort of advanced features are documented there as well. So there's been a lot of progress with PyScript. Uh, a lot has happened in the uh, two years that it's been around. Uh, but let's remind ourselves of kind of where we've come from. Uh, so this is Peter Wang, uh, one of the co-founders of Anaconda, and also one of the co-founders of PyScript. Uh, and when PyScript was originally created, uh, he had this mission statement of programming for the 99%. So um, what does that mean? Well, um, as we know, Anaconda is, uh, is famous for providing Conda and all the tools that scientific computing uses. And so for the 99% means those people who aren't professional software engineers who may use uh, coding as an activity that's orthogonal to their real work. So they're not really, uh, they, they just want the damn thing to work, really. Um, but also people who want to learn how to code as well. We need to make sure that the barriers to entry for these folks are very easy. And so uh, your introduction to Python shouldn't be, well, go to python.org, now download the thing. OK, now open your command line. Oh, what do you mean you don't know what a command line is? OK, it's that sort of thing. You can just point people with a browser at a URL, and then you get Python. So that's what we mean by uh, Python for the 99%. Isn't it? And also, one of the other founders of PyScript also talks about um, if you had a simple Hello World application, uh, how easy would it be for you to then give it to uh, your grandma, for example, uh, just as an example of someone who is possibly non-technical. Um, and he asks that question in all the talks that he does, mm -hmm. and uh, nobody puts their hand up. So PyScript is really trying to solve that problem yeah. as well, uh, shareability and ease of deployment. So like I said earlier, uh, for the 99% really comes down to meeting users where they are, um, depending on uh, technical ability, uh, what kind of application they want to build, uh, that sort of thing. So we spend a lot of time focusing on what our users want and listening to our community, asking them for suggestions, and they're very happy to produce that for us. I'd like to introduce uh, somebody else who's a part of the PyScript family. Uh, this is Martin. Uh, Martin uh, is a very dapper chap, as we can see from this picture. Uh, he's also a saxophonist and uh, an awesome Lindy Hop dancer as well, would you believe it? Uh, but uh, one of the kind of phrases that came out in a meeting uh, that Martin 
uh, was a part of with myself and Josh, uh, when we were talking about especially the beginner side of, uh, of the Python ecosystem was, um, well, if you want folks to learn how to code, don't teach them a programming language. Um, what? Surely we want them to learn Python and things like that. If only we knew somebody who was an expert in building a tool that engaged beginner software developers. I wonder who might have built such a tool for that sort of thing. Ah. Well, oh, hi. Yeah, me. Um, so uh, I put this in the presentation, um, I'll admit. Uh, this was me, age 10. Um, so that was only ago. two years ago. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> And here's me giving a presentation uh, at a local um, computer user group called uh, Raspberry Jam, which is focused around Raspberry Pi. Um, and I'm of the age where I've been lucky to kind of grow up around technology. I've never known life without the internet, which is um, why it's a bit of a straw when there's no internet, but never mind. Um, and the Raspberry Pi is what kick-started my uh, coding journey. And where I started was with an application called Scratch. Has anyone heard of Scratch before? OK, most people. Uh, so most beginners, uh, kids, mainly start off with Scratch uh, because it's really good at teaching coding concepts in a really fun and playful way. So the idea is that you basically drag and drop some blocks onto the screen, and you interact with um, different sprites and characters on the right here. And it provides a playground in which uh, beginners can experiment and have fun, uh, but also learn along the way. Um, which I think is a, a really good uh, feature of Scratch that is often um, overlooked. So you can create things like games, uh, stories. Um, the presentation that I was giving was an operating system in Scratch, which wasn't very useful, but uh, that was my kind of thing, creating uh, things like operating systems and that in Scratch and PowerPoint, which was a bit weird, I know, but uh, that's what I did. Um, but in contrast to if we want to learn Python or any other text-based programming language, uh, in UK schools, uh, computer science is um, a mandatory subject uh, in uh, secondary schools. Uh, so we give students this, which, as you can see, is quite a big contrast from that. And this produces a problem, right, because it's not very fun. Uh, Often the thing we ask students to do the first, or beginners, should I say, is type print hello world, and then it will say hello world. Uh, that's not really that f fun. Uh, and it's hard to relate to the, the real world as well. Um, the way that we teach Python in school isn't great. Uh, and it leads to a lot of students switching off, uh, which is a big problem if in 20 years' time we would like people to attend EuroPython, um, which I'm sure we all do. So my solution was to build something called EduBlox, uh, which is kind of a hybrid between text-based programming and uh, Scratch, uh, which allows students to uh, drag and drop uh, blocks of Python code onto the screen and play around with fun and visual libraries. Uh, and it's all about teaching the coding concepts uh, and having fun in the same ethos that Scratch is, uh, rather than print hello world, which you can do, but uh, that's not what it's all about. Uh, but the most important thing is that uh, EduBlox is all free and browser-based, uh, which you will see how it ties into PyScript. Uh, and actually, uh, EduBlox has recently switched to PyScript, and it's running uh, millions of projects in the few months that it's been live uh, with infrastructure costs of zero. Um, so no servers, uh, no hundreds of thousands of pounds being spent uh, so yeah, it's a success story of PyScript, I suppose, of being able to uh, empower anyone to learn how to code uh, through client-side Python. Uh, so definitely check out PyScript if you want to integrate uh, Python into your applications, because it's not just about creating projects. So we've talked about PyScript as an enabler for Python, so how do we get Python? Uh, we've also talked about um, uh, PyScript being uh, fun and uh, veering for the 99%. So being good engineers, we really don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and perhaps we should look around and see, well, where could we draw inspiration about the sorts of things we could build on top of PyScript such that people who aren't perhaps professional coders have a way of being able to build apps. So, you know, when I were a lad, things kind of looked a little bit like this. Uh, this is the Bill Atkinson, the uh, creator of 
HyperCard. HyperCard looked like this. It ran on Macs in the 1980s, and it was all about being able to draw and create applications as quick as possible. Um, the notion of a card was a thing, so these were very simple concepts to be able to explain. It's a very young-looking Bill Gates introdu introducing Visual Basic here. Um, and Visual Basic makes Windows programming fun. I like that. Um, <laughs> And again, that was all about being able to draw what it is that you wanted on the screen. And uh, this, is, uh, this is how a Visual Basic uh, app uh, works. Um, so you start to draw uh, the kind of different elements, so a text area or a text box. You drag and drop it, and you drop it on the thing. And so on the left-hand side, there's a kind of like a palette of all the different widgets that you might want to use. And on the right-hand side, there's kind of metadata, for instance, like the name of the thing, or its position, or its color, or things like that. And essentially, what you do is you just draw the thing. So we're starting from the user's experience of the app, which is an important thing. And it's kind of playful as well. It's exploratory and things like that. Um, so you, you sort of get uh, a very interactive um, development environment where you can see what it is that you want pretty much immediately. Um, and this clearly is an artificial intelligence application that only answers one question. Um, and so when you, click the, uh, when you click the button, and clearly you can run your app immediately to see how it works. So what is the capital of France? Well, the capital of France is Paris. So this is AI uh, in Visual Basic uh, from, the, okay. from the 1990s. Nobody wants to hear about that anymore. <laughs> this is how we write web applications now. Uh, the world has moved on to fun things like JSX, uh, where we get to pick uh, this week's trendy framework of choice. Uh, in fact, a new one has probably been released whilst we're giving this talk. Uh, and then we get to optimize for one of uh, 150 browsers, I think it is, over here, um, with all the same web standards, uh, which I promise are very much a thing that are respected by all browsers uh, in the world. Um, and then the extra hard drive space I need to buy uh, for all the patches that I need to store. Uh, isn't it great? <laughs> Better than what you just showed. Well, joking aside, clearly something's gone terribly wrong. Um, the application frameworks of today are all about features and how to do things and processes and technology and stuff that really is boring to anybody who isn't a software engineer. And we want to recapture that sort of enablement of perhaps what was going on in the 80s and 90s. So if only there were a way to recapture and create the expressiveness focus of the old days, but with the tech of today. If only we had something like Python in the browser or something like that. Never heard of it. <laughs> ah, yes. So, um, Josh and I, for the last few months, along with Martin, the saxophone playing la uh, dancer, uh, with a philosophical outlook, um, we've been working on something called Invent. Uh, Invent is an app creation framework. I just want to tell you the story of how we got to Invent uh, for a second before we show it to you. Now, this is a remarkable group of young people and their parents who I worked with. I'm sort of sat there in the middle with the, next to the guy with the cap on. Um, this is a neuro, neurodiverse group of folks. Uh, this is a group of folks from underrepresented groups in tech, but they get together. They're called Young Coders London. Um, and I was helping them just prior to COVID to learn how to code. I was teaching them coding. It was a lot of fun. It's, in fact, it was a great privilege to work with these folks. They're an incredible group of people. Um, and it, came clear to me that uh, you know, print hello world is quite boring if you're that age, okay? You want to be able to do something that actually works with your primary computing device, which is something like a mobile phone. And since, um, and since I had an opportunity, I thought, uh, could I create a framework that was inspired by HyperCard, that was simple to, uh, simple to assemble, extensible, and something that these young folks could create uh, apps for their phones with? And so I came up with something that I called, get this for naming <laughs> originality, Piper Card, um, uh, which I wrote on top of Kivi, so it would work on mobile devices. And uh, actually, the gentleman I'm about to talk about isn't on that photo, but one of the kids there, he wrote a tic-tac-toe game using this. Uh, I had no idea how he managed to do that. Uh, but he was taking the framework that I had quickly bodged together that was using these simple concepts that you uh, fit together like kind of um, thought Lego uh, to create something that uh, is really quite unusual. So I talked about uh, you know simple to understand core concepts, and so uh, that's what we've tried to do with with Invent. Yeah. So the idea of these core concepts is that they're very easy for beginners to understand, um, but also teachable. We want Invent to be 
uh, used uh, by a wide variety of people, uh, but we have specifically focused on uh, it being easy uh, to use for beginners, uh, but also extend to more advanced use cases as well. Yeah, so let's go through the core concepts that we have sort of uh, been trying out with, uh, with folks um, like in the last photo. So in an event app, pages, just like HyperCard, contain components used in the app. So these are kind of like widgets and buttons and things like that. Um, media are just assets used by the app. These are things like pictures and sounds and videos and things like that. Functions define custom behavior of the app. That's the business logic. And we use a sort of a pub-sub mechanism that we're calling channels that carry messages to coordinate behavior. Um, behind all of this, to keep state, we have a data store that is simply a key value store. And so, for example, the data store will publish messages on particular channels to say that certain items of data have been updated, and widgets on pages might be listening on those channels and they update themselves. In this way, the event application becomes reactive. And also, you might want to do more than one thing at once. So we have a very simple notion of, a little bit like a promise, but we call it a task, that does background stuff, and then a limitation we've imposed is that it, it, it uh, stores its results in a data store, in the data store, and the data store will signal via the channels that this thing has left a, uh, a result, and, um, and then the app can react to it. So I also want to point out that um, these, uh, I wonder if we have time. Uh, these, apps, these core concepts are supposed to be easy to teach and easy to learn. Literally, that's all you need to know in terms of high-level concepts to be able to write an invent app. And one of the things that I've been working on, I used to be a teacher, so I've been working on a whole series of an unplugged uh, activities, so unplugged means away from the computer, uh, where it's easy to be able to uh, teach what these... Um, core concepts are, are at an abstract sort of a level, so that when beginners, learners, uh, new coders, people who aren't that familiar with Python perhaps, um, they can, uh, they've already got in their mind's eye the right sort of mental model. So, uh, we're going to do a demo of Invent um, to build what you saw with the um, Visual Basic demo. Uh, so this is a very early version of the technology uh, that we're going to show you, um, but we would like the feedback, and um, that's really important to us that we are um, building a product that is driven by the feedback of the people who are going to ultimately use it. So let's go ahead yeah. and run the demo. And run the demo. Uh, yes, remember, this is pre-alpha, okay? Yeah. <laughs> So this is PyScript.com, and I'm going to clone a template app that is an invent app, an invent template. And so uh, this is the tooling. It's a little bit like Visual Basic. On the left-hand side, you've got a suite of widgets that you can drag and drop onto uh, a page. There we go. Uh, and on the right-hand side, um, you've got kind of metadata about whatever the currently selected widget might be. Um, and so you can do different things, like change the way these things look, uh, you know, change the text and all that sort of stuff. And of course, we're going to be uh, creating an AI application, because of course, everybody has to jump on that particular bandwagon. So here, we're creating a couple of keys in our data store. So there's a question for uh, what the user types in, and we have an answer, which is what the uh, AI will respond to. And we're saying here, by selecting that text area, we're saying that actually, uh, anything that you type in there goes in the question slot in the data store, and anything uh, that comes back as an answer goes in the text area at the bottom. And we're saying here that the channel that whenever you click the submit question button is the ask channel. And now we sort of switch to a block-based interface. Yeah, so this is the same sort of concept to, to Edgeblocks, where we're dragging and dropping blocks uh, to uh, create functionality within the application and make it work. Uh, behind the scenes, this is all just generating Python code. Um, and uh, as you can see, we're just dragging and dropping the things onto here. Uh, and then we go back to the builder. So the code that's oh, the code, produced, yes. the code that's produced is about 100 lines of Python, and most of that is because we were building up a kind of a DOM-like object. Um, so I've already created uh, an AI module, and I'm going to delete a whole bunch of stuff because this is an alpha version of the tool, so you know, don't look at that. Yeah. And uh, essentially what I'm going to do is just ask the overlords um, uh, from the uh, AI module here the prompt, okay? And that's going to return the result that we put in the answer slot in the data store. 
Um, and then finally, we're just saying, make sure that you include that AI.py module. And let's see, does it work? What is the capital of France? Sir. There we go. France is Paris. Thank you. There we go. Woo! <laughs> All apps are just a URL. So get your phones out. This is running MicroPython. It should just work for you. Um, I've put a limit on the amount of spend on my <laughs> credit card for ChatGPT. <laughs> So let's see how long it takes for you to sort of make it not work. But it should just come up. What a wonderful talk. Thank, Thank you, very, you very, much. very much. Thank you very much. So again, applause. <laughs> so we are now just coming to the Q&A session. So uh, feel free to go to the microphones. And um, when you're remote, you can also write on Discord, or even when your life is write on Discord your questions. And I got already one question. Where did you get, where did you get the, all these retro uh, videos? Sorry? The Wait. retro videos, or Windows videos, and oh, Mac yeah. videos. OK, uh, so the, um, the uh, VB stuff, that's me uh, using VirtualBox, or whatever it's called. Oh. Uh, Windows 98 installed it. <laughs> I, I just happen to know that Martin, Saxophone Martin updated things uh, on PyScript.com a couple of days ago, and uh, you're all going to get a trace back. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. We about should that. have checked that before we gave uh, the talk. It did work, I promise. Oh, man. Oh. Well, it's a good job we didn't do it live. <laughs> it's a good job we didn't do it live, yeah. So, cool. Are there any other questions in the audience? Feel free to stand up, be bold. Okay. No? Okay. So, uh, so we got three minutes left. Perhaps I also yep. got one. Um, wait, oh, sure. wait. Did, did you... uh, we've got one. Oh. Ah, <laughs> you. I attacked Tom. from the back. Yes. So I have a question. Did you uh, manage to push this idea towards wider teachers community? And did you experience any pushback from a few of those that kind of decided to go with their old tools? Uh, yeah, so I was actually at a teacher conference in, uh, back in the UK last week uh, where I was showcasing Edublox and also uh, the event work. Uh, and teachers were really positive about it, uh, mainly because they already teach Python um, and they already use Edublox as a tool, the majority of them. Uh, but they're really looking for something that helps increase engagement, like I was talking with that, tr with that transition from Scratch to Python, um, because Hello World doesn't really cut it. Uh, so to be able to have something that is, is as simple as that and allows you to drag and drop a few elements, build a, a real-world application, um, is, was really exciting for them um, to be as simple in the same amount of time, uh, but much more fun and engaging as well. The, the, the important thing is, is what I said about the young coders folks uh, uh, in London. You know, print Hello World, as Josh just said, doesn't cut the mustard these days. So if we can get a version of, of Python that runs on your mobile phone at the end of a URL without a trace back, oh, man, that's so embarrassing. <laughs> I'll never live that down. Um, uh, then you know, teachers, it, it's just going to be immediately um, interesting to kids, well, and beginner coders as well, um, all over the world. Very cool, very cool. So, are there other questions? We got one minute? No? Okay. Oh. Right, there's yeah. a question. Oh. Yeah. Do. This isn't quick, so maybe we can talk about it later, but I'm really curious of how you bridge the gap from sort of this beginning kind of interested in coding stuff to then doing finally getting at a real text editor, but maybe we can talk about that later. So. Sure, yeah. Cool. So, time's running out. What rest saying thank you for this wonderful talk and I get some cookies. Again. Thank you very much. Thank you.